Hey, what's going on, CISSP wannabes? Colin Weaver, IT Dojo, CISSP questions of the day. Bringing you two more questions to help you as you continue to get ready for that CISSP exam. So here comes question number one. Question is, the rules of engagement are a critical component of any penetration test. My question for you is, given the list of options that I'm about to put up, which of them is not something that you typically consider before starting a pen test? There's your options. Click pause, give them a look. When you think you got the right answer, click play and I'll break it down. All right, choice number one says the scope and range of the penetration test. Uh, no, that is something that you would consider, so that's not what we're looking for in this particular answer. We're doing the whole not thing. Uh, you absolutely, critically need to define what's in the range of the pen test. What's off limits? How far should you go? What are you trying to accomplish? Because what you certainly don't want to do is end up performing pen test activities on something that the client did not want you to go near. So it's really important that that stuff is very specifically defined. Choice number two says the tools that will be used. And this is not something that is typically defined up front. You're going to define objectives, you're going to define scope, you're going to define time frame, but you're not going to go in and specifically mandate or specify the individual tools that you're going to use. Now, that's not to say that there won't be a time when, when a particular tool set is requested or something like that, but in general, if you go look at pen test contracts, they don't specify which tools are actually going to be used to do it. So in this example, that's the answer choice that we're looking for. But let's go ahead and look at the other ones just to make sure, and then we'll move on. Third choice, time frame or duration of the penetration test. Absolutely, that stuff is in the contract for it. How long is this thing going to last? Are we going to do this for a week? Is it going to be for two weeks? What's the time frame? So that has to be laid out uh, in the contract as well. And then the last option on there is limits of liability. Uh, that These are protections that are built in for the people who are doing the penetration test. You certainly want to make sure that you're adequately protected. So it's, it's that fine line. You can't actually do things you're not supposed to do or they didn't want you to do but also they need to realize that this is a penetration test. And a penetration test can, when performed against the live network, cause things to happen that are detrimental to the performance of the network. So you wanna make sure that they hold you harmless for those things. So uh, that is definitely something that should be in your pen test contract. So that's it. Let's move on to question number two. All right, which of the following access control mechanisms will allow an information owner control, to control access to information resources based upon the subject, the object, and environmental considerations. Here's your list of answer choices. Give it a look, think it through. You got the answer, click play. All right, this question is pretty much kind of asking you for the definition of what attribute-based access control is, which is the right answer on this choice uh, or on this question. And if you sort of look at the different access control models that are out there, you have sort of the traditional, if you will, approach of going in and saying that this subject has this level of access to this object. And the stuff's all predefined. You go in and you set permissions on the file for this particular subject to be able to do stuff to this object, to be able to execute it or read it or write it or something like that. Um, that's all well and good, except it's kind of static and, and the only way it's ever going to get modified is to be modified by an administrator and it really has no capacity to take into account the diverse situations in which you might want to control access. You're just kind of saying, blanket, this subject can do this to this object. And in and, and this day and age, maybe that's not quite as versatile as we would need in some circumstances. Now, if you look at, say, role-based access control, you're kind of doing the same thing, except in role-based access control, you're going in, you're creating a role, and then giving that role the ability to do things uh, to an object. So once a subject is given a role, that role has the privilege to do things to an object, which, you know, by inference, then allows the, um, the subject to go in and do those things. Still things that are predefined and really don't go in and allow for any sort of, you know, dynamic or more... Uh, involved decisioning. And that's really where attribute-based access control shines. Now, um, attribute-based access control conceptually is nothing new. Okay, the, the idea of it has been around for a long time. It's just that we're more formalized now than we were a few years ago about talking about things that are attribute-based. Now, for example, you might want to go in and create a rule that says that, you know, only managers can write to the quality score values of a Virginia-based employee 
if that manager um, has one of those employees as a direct report. Uh, now you could do that with groups, but the but it's all static. Whereas with uh, with attribute based access control, it can be done dynamically. Uh, you could, for instance, also kind of extend this into uh, the world of like Chinese wall situations, where you're talking about conflicts of interest that might be created based upon previous access to certain files. Imagine if a subject had an attribute that was a, it's, it's just a you know a key value pair, you know some some name and then a value, kind of yes no, you know maybe so kind of stuff. Where you're going to say that let's say you have a, a, a data set for company X. And then there's an attribute associated with the user's object to say, you know, has access that data set or has not access that data set. So if I have not accessed that data set, and so I as a user who has not accessed data set A am now trying to go in and access an object that's in data set B, well then my access would be allowed because that attribute of my object is currently set to has not accessed data set A. But then comes a time when I go in and I access something in data set A. If I access something in data set A, then the attribute of my user object changes. So the next time I try and go in and access something in data set B, we can evaluate the attribute to say that this user has accessed something in data set A, so therefore does not have the ability to go in and read the contents of data set B. And what that creates is, is policy-based dynamic access control based upon attributes of the subjects and objects. The other cool part about this is that we can also bring environmental factors into it. We can bring things like, say, GPS location. We can bring um, IP subnets and any other kind of location-related kind of information to say that you can only access this data if you are this person with this attribute and the subject has this attribute and some other environmental factor is also specified. So if you only want people to be able to access data when they're in a certain location, for instance, or using a certain device, then attribute-based access control lends itself to that. And it does it by using this notion of, of policy-based decisions that are independent of the subjects and objects themselves. So we don't have to go in and, and hard code permissions, we can go in and create policies that define permissions based upon subject, object, and attribute, uh, or excuse me, and environment and the attributes of those three. Uh, that makes it incredibly powerful. Uh, that also makes it potentially very complicated. So again, lots and lots of power with attribute-based access control, but also um, a, a pretty substantial amount of complexity that can come to the table too. So, but it is what it is. So you, you may find value in it, you may not. But that be, certainly from an exam perspective, you wanna be aware of what ABAC is, or ABAC, however you wanna say it. All right, sweet, two more questions down. That's all I got to say, bye.